everyone, it's Diane here. I was just going to let you guys know that as we enter into the part two of this discussion, that we do get into some uh, sticky topics that are potentially sensitive in nature. So we run the gamut on things that are fairly complex and people can have multiple opinions regarding. So what I want everyone to think about as we enter into this conversation is that we recognize that we're pulling from this particular book, but there are larger conversations surrounding each of these sensitive topics that are presented here. We're going to talk about mental illness. We're going to talk about incarceration and police presence as well. And I recognize that all of those are are pretty sensitive topics. And we dive into them pretty quickly in some cases. So I want to make sure that we also preface this conversation here at the beginning by saying that we recognize that some populations are more targeted for incarceration. And very often that can happen in an unfair manner. There's more to say on these, and you can listen to hear about it, but we recognize that there's a a lot that we're attempting to cover in this episode, so bear with us as we muddy our way through these waters. Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me as always are my fabulous co-hosts. Hey, Rob, it's Diana. Hi, it's Jackie. I got, I, I, I'm really sorry if I'm sounding kind of sound kind of hoarse. I feel like I'm, I got like a random summer cold. You, you know, like one of those things where you're sick, but you're not that yeah. sick. And you're like, what is happening? It's summer. Yeah, and, and like my nose ran a little bit, and then it sort of just lose my voice. That seems to be how I get sick in my older age, is it's sort of like, you don't feel sick enough to, you know, stay home or rest or have anyone feel bad for you. You're just going to lose your voice, and then everyone will just pity you, but still expect you to do everything you <laughs> normally would do, which sadly, when part of it is talking for like an hour and a half or so, kind of makes you less fun to listen to. But yeah. oh, well. I think it makes you more fun to listen oh, to. Oh, well, thank you. I highly disagree. Rob, why couldn't the pony go to school? Because it was a horse? He was a little horse. Ah, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Did you find that in the box of a popsicle? No, I wrote it myself. <laughs> or maybe not. That's good. Oh, I what was the, I I had a bunch when we were driving we were driving the other <laughs> day. That time I was funny. That was so funny. No, it's not. Oh, it was, I was doing like a bunch of like ancient Egyptian jokes. I don't. Remember. I don't. You don't remember that they were that good? Oh no! Okay. Why did the Egyptians plow the field. Huh? So it was Pharaoh. Ha! <laughs> ah, no, no. It's um. What was the one I had? Oh, how come the Pharaoh couldn't find a date? He didn't know anyone who he had anything toot in common with. Oh my god! <laughs> wow, but this isn't classic. a podcast about dad jokes. Pun. No, this isn't a podcast about dad jokes or summer colds. It's a podcast about behavior analysis. And behavior analytic research. Every week, we bring you a new episode where we pick a topic in behavior analysis and find some research articles to discuss like an old-fashioned journal club. Except this week and last week, if you listen to last week's episode, which, you know, this one has part two in the title, so probably listen to the first one, is not a journal club, but more like a book club. Book club! We're all hanging out at a coffee shop. We picked one of Oprah's favorite behavior analytic books. No. Uh, we chose a book on the topic of behavior analysis. We read that book, and in the span of two podcasts, we are doing kind of an in-depth dive and discussion into a book. And who would like in-depth to... In-depth skim. An, in, an in-depth skim? That's what I like to call it. Okay. Skim. It's like skim milk with water added. Okay. So you read every other page and just the first paragraph, and what do you There's mean? There's not a time, for, I think, for an in-depth dive. They okay. take more than a couple hours. It's, it's an in-depth skim. So okay. it's like diving into a four-foot pool. If you're in a book club, though, with like other people, don't you just read a book and then meet one time for like an hour? Yeah. And, read, and talk about the whole book? And, and knit while you do that? And book drink tea? Book clubs are just an excuse to gossip. Okay. Or watch So you don't even discuss the book. Maybe. I don't, it depends on your book club. I don't know. Well, in any case, in this book club, we do a decent, decent dive. How about that? Okay. Into the book we read in the interest of time. And last year, we did our book club on parent positive parenting. And before then, we did Supervisor's Guide. And this year, we chose a book by the late, great Murray Sidman, Coercion and Its Fallout. So if you would like to hear anyone discuss the first, say, 10 chapters of Coercion and Its Fallout then you should totally listen to last week's episode in which that is exactly what we did. 
because this week we'll be discussing the second half of the book, chapters 11 through 19. But let's do a really quick summary, sort of, of, of what the first half of the book was about. Diana, go. What was the first half of the book about? The first half of the book, Rob, was about coercion and control. Introducing those topics to us. And the main takeaway of about the first, mm, maybe six chapters, was that coercive behavior is really maintained by avoidance from punishment and or negative reinforcement, right? So there's going to be something, some aversive quality to the control that's occurring with the behavior, either that the behavior is escaping from something aversive or having something aversive terminated and thereby increasing their behavior. And whichever way it goes, it should be thought of as coercion and that there are actually better ways to control behavior than through coercion. Although he doesn't tell us what those are yet. Nope. No. It's, a bit it's of like a spoilers. He's like, but there are better ways. I'll get back to that. Yeah. And yeah. then in the later chapters. Yeah. So Jackie, how would you sum up the second half of this book versus the first half of this book? So the first half of this book was a primer, one mm. might say. I found it a little more difficult to read than the second part of the book. So if you feel that, keep going. Yeah. It gets so much better. It's not that it's bad, but it's just, it's I primary. I familiar yeah. with yeah. the topic right. already, so it... It didn't read as fast or as like, ooh, what's going to happen on the next page? What's sort of the equivalent of when you've been reading, you know, 10 articles about a given topic. Right. And, oh, my God, are they going to tell me that, you know, oh, autism is, uh, you know, a spectrum of different <laughs> yeah. needs. Yeah, 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 I get it. But, yes. Because you know, you've read a bunch of them. Right. It's sort of that, except it then expanded about over, you know, 90 pages of right. text so rather than I paragraph. felt like the part part one of the book was necessary, but could have been condensed a little bit. But part two is I think fairly interesting because that's where he starts talking about how coercion affects everyday life, right? So all of the main like facets of human existence he tries Mm -hmm. to tackle and tie the these main theoretical issues of of societal importance to the laboratory animal, which I think is fascinating. Yeah. You Um, get the feeling that part two is why he wrote the book. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But he had to get through part one. Mm -hmm. But did he? To get to part two. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, let's let's save that for final thoughts. (laughs) Yeah. So the first chapter we're going to be discussing is chapter 11, Neuroses and Mental Illness. And I don't know if it's going to be worth going into too deep detail on this chapter because I think a lot of the concepts that Sidman is discussing in this chapter relate to a lot of kind of psychological terminology that I don't want to, I don't want to say it's fallen out of favor, but is not. Well, it's not the circles that we or other yeah. behavior analysts usually travel in. So it, it may be that those terms seem. Foreign to us. It makes me think of that scene in the Adams Family movie when the con lady is trying to pretend to discuss with Gomez why the guy impersonating Uncle Fester is really Uncle Fester and, and she describes displacement. Mm-hmm. And for years I thought that was a fake term that she had oh, made up yeah. for a, this comedy movie. And then I realized as an undergrad, oh no, that's actually a real thing in terms of a real thing in the field of psychology. But when you describe something and it sounds like something a con man would make up, sort of makes you a little less interested in talking about it at length it basically i think the portions of this chapter that are relevant refer more to the ideas of say when he taught when simon talks about anxiety and the idea of anxiety as you know the way i think we'd all want to speak about anxiety is it's sort of you know private events most of the things that we feel quote-unquote anxious about relate to things that are coercive in nature that we therefore try to avoid that we tend to develop more and more elaborate avoidance behaviors to avoid. So when you think about anxiety as sort of a component of the general coercion that we encounter in our day, I think that makes a much more meaningful definition of why we have anxiety problems. Yeah, and one thing I really like that he brings up that I think we've been talking about more in the behavior analytic community is that these bigger terms like anxiety or depression have traditionally been referred to as something that's untouchable to us right because Mm -hmm. they're very complex they're internal and he he talks about them too like writer's block or writer's cramp as he says Mm -hmm. you know that it's something we say like oh i have anxiety or i have depression without actually talking about the behaviors that include that 
So for the functions that maintain right the behavior. So I lo- I love that he brings that up because that's how traditionally we think about anxiety. And he was even starting, you know, this is book was written in the nineties that starting to to think about how we as behavior analysts could be a part of that treatment, maybe not be the sole provider of that treatment, but be a part of the treatment when dealing with anxiety or depression Mm -hmm. or even writer's block, right? Mm -hmm. So that could be a real thing and a real problem if you are an author (laughs) and you need to write for a living. So I love that, how he sets that up for us and then goes about talking about why and how anxiety comes about. Mm -hmm. I think he has a a longer section or paragraph on the idea of the obsession, of, of obsessions and of compulsions, Mm -hmm. which on the one hand, I understood what he was talking about in the sense of we engage in, in, in these various behaviors, the compulsions that probably have something to do with a coercive event that we're trying to avoid. Um, you know, his example is elaborate example of, you know, the man who, Oh, I got to go to a job interview. Oh, but I forgot to, you know, check my tie. Oh, now I forgot to lock my door. Oh, I forgot to turn off my stove. Oh, and now I'm late to the interview. I might as well not bother going. And while I understood how he was describing that idea of sort of what we think of as obsessions and compulsions in terms of the behavior of obsessions and compulsions relating to coercive events and learned behavior, I'm not sure if it's taking into account, I think, a lot of what current wave, you know, behavior therapies or even, um, you know, I, I know like we, we go back and forth with, you know, relational frame theory and what that means in terms of talking about mental illness, but the idea of a lot of mental illness is private events and how, you know, our private verbal behavior can impact our, our, our somatic response. Right. And so in that regard, a lot of this chapter felt like I get you, but I feel like you're oversimplifying. I agree. The situations. And maybe you're not, you know, because again, maybe maybe we as behavior analysts have just decided to over complicate the mm-hmm. behavior of mental illness so that we can kind of get a piece of the pie in terms of people seem to want these like complicated descriptions of thoughts that are the circular logic, mm-hmm. which Sidman also talks about how that's that's silly. You know, we don't have anxiety. You engage in behavior <laughs> related to the, the stimuli in your environment. Yeah. But it, it did feel a little not quite simplified, but it didn't sell the point, I think, that the overall book was trying to make as much as, say, later chapters Yeah, did. I'm going to agree with you. And I think that if he was going to write this chapter, I think he should include others as well because he wasn't a master of you mental other, other professionals. professionals? Okay. Yeah, he, he should have included others in this chapter, mm-hmm. I think, specifically because it, this wasn't his, like, wheelhouse, right? Yeah. So we all know that he doesn't – he didn't, like, treat mental illness. Yeah. And so I think it, it might have been interesting to have perspective of people that do – and how that, in the behavioral and analytic realm, how that works. Although I agree with him, the principles are probably there, right? But I think that there might be more going on, or less. But mm-hmm. I think he might not know. Right. Well, a whole book could be written, could about, be that. written about this one yeah. chapter. Yeah. So it, it had to be simplified mm-hmm. in that way. And I think, you know, one of the main points he's trying to take away from this is, what's the origin of right. this and mm-hmm. we don't have to always just chase something back into the mind and say well this person's just like this and that's why they're engaging this behavior so i think he was attempting to sort of set up a scenario where one could see how behavior could be reinforced and then continue to manifest in ways that were overall non-functional right yeah. another part of this chapter that i actually really loved is when in the chapter where he talks about what is abnormal and I love that he brings about that behavior isn't necessarily like quote unquote normal, right? Because what's normal for one community or verbal community is going to be quite different from what another verbal community is. So he talks about like what behavior would be richly rewarded in Los Angeles would send Bostonians into psychotherapy. Yeah, I loved that. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it's something to think about too, right? That there isn't like a static rule of like this behavior is normal, this behavior is abnormal. So it's I think it's more moving depending on the verbal community that you're in. And I like that point mm-hmm. that he that he brings up there. Yeah. yeah. And what I should have said previously really was the behavior that's not socially functional, right? In an effort to steer away from saying abnormal. But when one is engaging in behavior that's socially non functional, we should remember that it's functional at that point in time for that person. So there's a function to it, and it's somehow adaptive based on their current situation and their history. Mm -hmm. I think, too, the point of 
looking at abnormality, and we have a whole statistical manual discussing what is abnormal and how so much of it has been colored by what we as society overall find to be aversive to us, and therefore should you know can we mm-hmm. look at the dsm as almost like a, a manual of coercive things that drive us nuts and please make these go away because most of us don't like this stuff you know thinking about how homosexuality used to be in the dsm and this is this certainly isn't a knock against the, <laughs> the the team that develops the dsm every every few years or anything but that idea of so many mm-hmm. of the areas that we as a society found coercive at various points in human history could be defined as abnormal like we took this great thing we took the science the science of the mind and science of learning and we found another way to sort of tack on like how can we use this to be coercive to other people (laughs) you know almost as like if we can find these things and we can get rid of them because they're really annoying and most of us don't like them very much so if you could have that go away. That'd right, be but again, great. that's that's just truth by agreement for a majority. And that's not to say that if someone is within the minority that they are automatically wrong. If the yep. majority can label them as abnormal, then likely they're going to. But that doesn't mean that there's necessarily uh, anything non-functional about how they're operating. Mm. Now, there may be other people that legitimately need assistance, right? And that should be viewed as something where society can come together and hopefully help that individual if they and other parties agree that assistance is needed. Mm. But those are two separate things. Yes. Let's move on from this chapter. So I, I think we had some problems with this chapter. So let's get into it. Let's, why did we start with that one? Because I guess it came next in the order. <laughs> the next chapter I really enjoyed. I don't... I kind of go back and forth as to whether it's sort of a chapter that I think is as salient and important to some of the other chapters. But I do like the idea of describing how our conscience, our little Jiminy Crickets, are all oh, a product of coercion and how so much of what we as as a society or as individuals have developed as sort of like good moral thinking really is a product of because we've been punished for anything else and that only works for so long when you don't meet the contingencies of, of avoidance or or you're over or you're punished even though you're engaging in mostly, you know, conscientious behavior. Right, so the title of this chapter is Coercion and the Conscience. And I was actually going to ask you, Rob, before you said about Jiminy Cricket, did you visualize the conscience as the Donald Duck angel and devil? No. No, I visualized it as Jiminy Cricket. Me too. I know what you're talking about. Are you talking about the one where Donald skips school? Yeah. Well, Donald, there's a a lot of Donald with his angels and devils. It's whenever he has the angel and the devil. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't think you that though. You just love Donald Duck so much. I do I love Donald. No, I know it's the one. Assume that he he was your conscience. He doesn't actually. want. No, he doesn't want to go to school. And the devil's like, "Come on, you." He doesn't have a Donald Duck voice. He's like, "You should come out and go fishing." And he's got his little books with a strap. Yeah. And then they go to school at the end, and they sing la 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 la. la, la, la. So Rob has seen that one. Uh-huh. Oh, I got. I think I have it somewhere. You want to watch those old Disney cartoons, man? They are hard. They are hard to come by. So when we talk about the conscience, yeah. what we're talking about is. That internal voice that tells us right from wrong. And, and again, the conscience is a metaphor. It's not a real thing. Give a little whistle. So it's something that's in you. It is not literally some sort of a bug that, that travels around. P.S. Did you know in the original Pinocchio, Jiminy Cricket is murdered by Pinocchio? <laughs> no. In the really? Book, in when the he Carlo has to go to Temptation book. Island? No, he dies like really early on. And then his ghost comes back to haunt him. Like, I... I don't know how they made that book into a cartoon because it is sounds terrifying. I never it read the book. It's quite terrifying. Yeah. The, well, the movie is. And the, the, the movie is pretty terrifying. Pretty terrifying. One thing I love about this part is that he. This is where I kind of see where he pulls in the laboratory animal with humans, right? Because we don't usually think of animals as having a conscience per mm-hmm. se, right? But he tells us exactly what an animal would do in the presence of punishment, in the presence of a shock, yeah. in the presence of something, you know. I'm using my quotes, something bad. And it's very similar to what you would see when someone's faced with the dilemma of doing something that society feels is not great and there's yeah. like some temptation. This was right? the best rat description I in agree. the entire I totally book. agree. And I could see it. I feel like it made, it made all the other ones that were like, yeah, 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 I understand how rats you know, work, work with some sort of a punishment contingency. It made all of those that we kind of were a little – not dismissive of last time, but we kind of, you know, we started rolling our eyes a little bit as, as they kept coming back to the rat experiments. Made it all worth it for this one because this is one I never would have thought of. Like you were saying, Jackie, I never would have thought mm-hmm. of this is a behavior that we can see in rats. That behavior that you see in young children 
of understanding that something that they once in one a behavior that they once engaged in that didn't seem to matter very much is now something that they will be punished for. And so the description, I'll do the kid one, Jackie, and then if you want to you know, talk about the rat, the rat one. one. So, you know, you think about little kids. You think about how little kids, when they're little babies, and they start grabbing at things, and they start pointing at things and babbling. Everything's the best thing they've ever done. Because, again, you know, what do we want our babies to do? We want them to start walking. We want them to start using the bathroom. We want them to start talking. We're literally it's taking pictures behavioral with cusps. everything. Yeah, everything's a behavioral cusp. We want picture, we want picture. to meet all those cusps. So, it doesn't matter what they do. It's adorable. Like, when you think about young children, they're starting to walk, and they're, like, yanking things off the counter, and they're going, oh, oh. We're like, it's adorable. Isn't this great? But at some point... We decide we've had enough of this. <laughs> They're like, there's too many broken plates. And all of a sudden, the kid does something that they've done before. They start yanking something off a counter. They're grabbing something they shouldn't have. And rather than being like, oh, you, baby, you're like, we go, no. We yell at them or we smack them on the hand or we grab them away. And, you know, hopefully if we're, you know, good parents, we take them away and we you know, give them something else to do. But we could just yell at them and say, no, don't touch that. No, that's not for you. No, bad baby. You know, we might say something like that. Yeah. And the example in the book is a, a vase. Yeah. A vase. Yeah. That might that they're trying to grab that might fall on them, so it's a safety thing. Yep. And how again, since they're little kids, they don't necessarily learn. Oh, vases are not to be touched. They sort of just get confused, and then later on, they come back to the vase and they come back to the vase, and they're like, "I'm going to grab this again." And then, of course, the mom or the dad yells, "No, don't touch that again." And then Sounds over like time, a horrible parent. <laughs> you can kind of see the kid doing that whole like they'll go near the vase, and then rather than going over and touching it, they'll sort of do that like I'm walking to it. Oh, uh, I better walk away, or they'll start repeating back the statements their parents made, like no, no, don't touch it, or no, bad baby. They'll, they'll start repeating that back, mm -hmm. and then. <laughs> You know, the outside observer, especially if they love mentalistic metaphor language, will be like, it looks like little Susie has developed a conscience, and that's why she's not touching the face. And of course, we as behavior analysts know right what's really, yeah, well, they know right from wrong. We know what's really happened. And then that brings us to what what happened? Because we could do this with a rat. The one thing I love about it is he, he puts like a, a subjective, like humanistic point of view when he talks about the rats so he's yeah. like yeah the rats has a history of reinforcement for pressing the lever pressing the lever everything's lovely we all know this happens and then when he presses the letter uh, the lever one time he gets punished the rat's like what the he's like well that probably was just a doozy presses it again gets another shock runs away to the other end of the chamber and then the thing i love and he's like but still the rat the loving lever calls yeah him. <laughs> he's like the lever still tempts the rat <laughs> So he comes closer, turns away, comes closer, turns away. And I'm like imagining a little <laughs> rat with like little love eyes being like, lever, <laughs> lever, I'm coming for you. Right. So there's still that back and forth that you see. Mm -hmm. And then, he, you know, after a long period of time, they're like, maybe it works again because of that history of reinforcement. So again, he presses the lever and punishment is delivered in the, in the form of a shock. Uh, and then you see responding suppress altogether. Yeah. You see that with humans as well, which yeah. I thought was fascinating. And I love just the like coming and going, coming and going. You see that in real world. And since we're talking about most most likely pretty much the exact same behavioral mechanisms in play, we don't talk about the rat as having a really strong developed conscience, though. We talk about the human having a developed sure. conscience. But again, is that just, and Sidman would say yes, just a metaphorical construct that our society has created to try to explain in very poor terms why some people do good things and some people do bad things. Right. Why? It's because they have a good conscience or they have a bad conscience. Like it's some sort of an internal thing that like, uh-oh, it sounds like Billy killed his Jiminy Cricket. That's why he does bad things. But Pinocchio didn't kill his Jiminy Cricket. So that's why he does good things. I do, I do love the metaphor. He's like, if this rat were a person and it was a churchgoer, it would confess that it had been a sinner, mm -hmm. <laughs> but now is reborn. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And this brings us to the problem, I think, of how our society rewards people who do the right thing and have a good conscience. Because if almost all of the things that we do, quote unquote, that are good, are based on some sort of a history of, coer of coercion, a history of shock, a history of punishment, how long will we continue to do, quote unquote, the right thing? And I think we see this – I think the nice thing about our – you know, we sort of talked about how Sidman wrote this book at a different time. I think one of the things he'd be really excited to see in terms of his discussion of conscience in this chapter is how all his discussion of how many people get away with crimes and how we don't necessarily think that's ne the same bad thing that we used to. You know, uh, we have so many businesses doing all these horrible things. And I think we've all realized society, oh, they kind of get away with it. Why do they get away with it? It's not because they have bad consciences. It's because they're continuing to get rich. 
And because yeah. we are continuing to benefit from their bad behavior. So, of course, we don't care that they're doing things that are, quote unquote, bad. Because we're all... Who says we don't? The, the grand society. I'm not, I'm not oh. pigeonholing not you. Us. Not us three. The big we. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, the people big, with the, the royal we. that matter don't care. Yeah. The big we. <laughs> and again, the idea that the conscience works as it has been described here because when children are young, we are watching them all the time. So it's really easy for us to punish them when they do things that we don't like and to hopefully reward them when they do things that we like. But more often than not, we probably just punish them for doing the things we don't like. But as we become adults... We realize kind of the fallacy of the conscience in that no one is punishing me for doing bad things. I am only choosing not to do these bad things because I don't know why. You know, we don't know why. But hey, guess what? It's because you were punished for doing bad things at one point. But we engage in so much behavior to avoid a punishment that's probably not going to come. And we all realize this at some point because we see so many people doing quote unquote bad things and never contacting that punishment contingency anymore. And we all go, what the hell? And some of us just sort of like, you know, that cult behavior. Well, I'm going to double down on my conscience. I'll never do anything bad because, I mean, I, I think humans don't like to lose and we don't like that. Whatever private event is going on, it sucks to feel like I've been a sucker for the past 20 years of my life. I could have been getting ahead. I could have been well, cutting corners. I mean, I think it depends on the company that you keep too, mm -hmm. right? So if everyone within your social circle is maintaining those same rules, quote unquote, conscience, then... They're going to see behavior of people outside of that circle as, as other and more evidence of their waywardness by engaging in that behavior, even if they're contacting reinforcers in the here and now. Right. So you can maintain that for a long, your lifetime. You could. Yeah. But I think, again, one of the nice things about living in our modern society where everything is so much smaller than it was is that it's very hard to live in a society where – you are with the exact same audience for your entire life because we're constantly seeing things from around the world that we did not have I access don't know. to. Aren't we all living in an echo chamber? Yeah, I know. Oh, I guess that's true. <laughs> I also, because I come from a very small town that most people never leave, and so they don't actually contact the contingencies that other communities will contact, right? So I just went to my hometown. Hey, hometown, if you're listening, what up? And it's pretty much the same, <laughs> right? Like... <laughs> I have been I haven't been there in what 20, 20 years because it was my twenty year high school reunion, and it was pretty much the same. So I mean, it depends on your verbal community, right? And like what you're accessing, and who you come in contact with. But it could very you could very well be with the people you graduated from high school, and then you all go and work at the same place because it's the only place that you can work, and you see them. That's mm. it. That's all you see, depending on where you live. I still think that overall. The, our ability to contact the other is much more likely nowadays. Than, I agree with you. You know, they just I cast agree. they just cast a, an a, an African American actress to play Ariel. You know, that's a well known story. A bunch of people are going to go see that movie, and they're going to see, "Whoa, it's Ariel!" And she's not going to be the white redhead that she was in the cartoon. And you and could say, okay. "Well, they might refuse." Yeah, no, yeah, it's, it, yes, I'm not, <laughs> not. I'm not making any sort of statement about the casting, but the idea that people might have seen that movie. And they will probably go see the next big budget live action Disney movie because that's what a They're lot of so people go right do. Now. And they might not think too much about like, she looks different than the cartoon. They might not even care that it's different. According to the internet, it's a big deal. <laughs> but, yeah. Well, the internet is the not internet. representative. The internet's the internet. Yeah. Of the they don't, they're, the they're the worst audience ever because they don't have any of the... <laughs> yeah, but I, I they need it's... some coercion on that internet if you ask me. We tried to talk about that the other day, and you said you told us no, no. What? We tried to say that there should be more coercion on the internet, and you told us no. Oh, oh, I, in the sense of, I mean, if that's our, our go-to is, we should just get some more coercion. I said it in a funny, <laughs> more coercion. Voice. We never want but to say I, more, co more coercion. No, about but anything. I think that one of the takeaways from this chapter here is, if you are continuing to engage in behavior underneath a strict code of conduct and not accessing freely available reinforcers for engaging in behavior that would be quote unquote bad, then chances are that that code of conduct was set up through some level of yeah. coercion itself. Right. And again, the, the idea that Sidman really does not come back to for another like four or five chapters, that what if we used reinforcement for doing the right thing rather than coercive practices? And then he kind of stops and then he moves on. To One chapter. of my, I think my favorite sentence in the entire book is at the end of this chapter where he's just like, we need a replacement for the conscience. And then he's like, mic drop. I'm out of this chapter. Moving on. 
<laughs> I like love that when I read that I was like, Booyah, Simon. <laughs> But then chapter, gotta go to dinner. Yeah. And then chapter 13 is not what's the replacement for the conscience. Nope. It just sort of continues to double down on how awful it is that we live in this coercive society. So chapter 13 is entitled Between a Rock and a Hard Place. Again, that metaphor, illusion, I don't, that we are constantly in a situation, no matter what we choose or no matter what behavior we engage in, we will meet some sort of a horrible, aversive consequence. One of the issues that... He talked, we talked about it last week too, but really that idea of when you are likely to meet a punishment contingency or a coercive contingency, you are going to engage in a couple of the same behaviors. So you're going to either just continue to engage in the same behavior, maybe if the punisher is not so, so bad, so strong, or you're going to escape. However, a lot of the time when we use coercion, we can't really predict the outcome of our coercive practice because there are a lot of other variables that we're not paying attention to. So he has the great example of, you know, when someone is in a terrible job, they may or may not quit. Why may, why might they quit? Well, they hate their job. They're going to find another job. They're in a highly profitable field where they can get another job easily versus the person who has, you know, they're trying to pay off a second mortgage. They have a sick wife or husband. They have kids they're trying to put through college. They'll put up with the coercive mm -hmm contingencies because they sort of have to their well, life is coercive yes everything's so coercive from all fronts right and how this leads to a lot of what we see when we talk about the idea of i think everyone talks about flight or fight like it's the first time anyone's ever said that like oh it's like flight or fight and the idea of so much of what we do in our society really leads to that f fight or flight response you know so many threats that we know we can't escape therefore how do we respond well of course by being really productive right no by doing nothing by freezing up by sort of just allowing that contingency to come into play and not changing our behavior and how most of the time the others in the society who usually are the ones engaged in the coercion see this as some sort of a willful response like, oh, well, you're not doing your best work. How dare you? I'll double down on my coercion. Whereas what's probably happening is this is an individual who has so many coercive contingencies in play right now. They just have nothing. They can't engage in any behavior whatsoever. Yeah. And that was based in animal experiments as well, where they, they establish a tone as a signaled conditioned punisher for an upcoming shock mm -hmm. and found that even though food was continually available during the tone, which lasted for like a minute, the animal would not engage in lever pressing to access food while the tone was on, sort of waiting for this impending shock and just engaged in behavior that we might consider to be panic or anxiety related behavior instead. So if you have an unavoidable impending aversive upcoming in your life, then you're unlikely to engage in functional behavior that would allow you to access other reinforcers. You're just going to engage in th these types of anxiety based behavior instead mm -hmm. one of the saddest most like brain exploding examples in here for me was the one of the elderly lady oh yeah oh, yeah. oh my gosh i never even thought of that so i'm going to give you mm -hmm. like a little rundown so this lady uh was married you like how i'm talking about like i know her <laughs> this lady was married and they she lived in a mansion right and so her duties she was like a stay-at-home lady uh so she she ordered the household around right so she had guests and she had staff working with her and you know she like landed gentry kind of yeah lady. it sounded like it didn't it a little bit so she had lots of household duties that she liked and so she mm -hmm. found these these duties reinforcing so she you know increased them it wasn't that she had to do them but then her husband died and in order to make life easier they thought for everyone because the house was too big there was too many things her family moved her into an apartment which was smaller right didn't bring the wait staff with them mm -hmm. um, in the city so was she could access city. things so she could access things it was but because all of her reinforcers were tied in with the behavior she was engaging in previously now in this new city environment which supposedly should have been better and easier for her led to a loss of reinforcers so that everything about her new surroundings uh, signaled punishment so mm -hmm. signaled the lack of reinforcers mm -hmm. and he makes this really good point that even if you're putting someone in a place that there's love and care, right? And you're, they're being treated nicely may not be sufficient to evoke those reinforcers to increase, you know, appropriate behavior, uh, which I was like, oh, I wrote something to think about, right? As all of our parents are getting older, just being well taken care of may not be enough, mm -hmm. right? And he brings this point up a few times and it ties in perfectly 
to our previous conversations about people and, and animals preferring contingencies over non-contingently available reinforcers. And that is true for all people, including our older individuals as well. So having purposeful behavior and ways to access meaningful reinforcement through behavior is equally important uh, no matter what stage of life you're in. That was a sad anecdote. Oh my yeah. gosh, it was. I was like, oh my gosh. I never thought of it that way though. Right? It makes sense. Even it, even providing a plant right, to take care of. To take care of, they have shown increases like health and life expectancy for nursing home individuals. I just, and that all they are doing is just watering a plant. Yeah. But that's meaningful behavior. Right. I just didn't think of it that way. It makes me want to like go do a lot of work. Yeah. So for for them, right? I mean, not not myself, but <laughs> reminds me. Of Diana's this. going to work right now. Oh, <laughs> it reminds leave. me of this old Judge show. We I used to watch on like summer vacations. You know, you just like whatever's on TV, and it was like a dramatization. What is it called? I don't remember what it was called. Some old ju- Judge what, show. One of those old Judge shows. It wasn't like People's Court. Murphy it was like Brown? a more dramatic. No, Murphy mm-hmm. Brown's not a Judge show. Uh, no, no it's, a, it's about Murphy Brown, who is a, a network lawyer. anchor she on FYI. Murphy Brown. No, she was a reporter. Oh, I thought she was a lawyer, too. What? Was a lawyer. No. Murphy Brown was one of the, like, lead reporters on the the news program FYI with Frank Fontaine and okay, Corky. I didn't watch that show. And Jim. I guess I didn't. And, she, you know, she was, like, a hard-hitting reporter in Washington, D.C. Anyway, that has nothing to do with anything. Okay, I was talking sorry. about a fake judge show, which also has nothing to do with anything, I suppose. <laughs> but, you know, the case was about a... It was about like a like a like an elderly mother who was going through kind of early dementia and she was like starting to break things and the family was not sure what to do with her. And in the end, the result was your mother is not able to take care of herself anymore. You can't care for her. She needs to go to a home. And as a child, I thought this is so awful that they would put someone who is like a grandmother, who is a mother, that they would put them in this home that they clearly don't want to be in. And the actress was as far as I remember, but it was amazing Emmy Emmy caliber, mm-hmm. daytime Emmy caliber performance of how like confused and upset she was about the whole thing. Then as I got older, I started thinking about, well, at some point, I think that's, you know, when you have elderly parents, you have to put them in a home at some point because you can't take care of them. And then in the past couple of years, I've sort of come back around on that really thinking about it as, as the reality of our aging parents has come to be of, I don't want that to be what happens. And, you know, this really sends home that point of, even if you put your parents in like a super great, you know, maximum, max, not maximum security, but like <laughs> maximum not right. security in the sense of they're so nice and it makes you feel secure and how safe you are, you're still losing so much reinforcement. And as Sidman would say, if you remove reinforcers, that is the same as delivering a shock. Right. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's amazing. And that is very sad. I kind of wonder if he'd written this chapter 10 years later or 15 years later, whether we would have called it First World Problems. Because I think he does end it with the idea of so much of our behavior and so much of our sort of freezing up in life comes from just we have so many shocks. They're not signaled or they're signal or they're signaled. They're signaled all over the place. And that leads to so much of kind of the general malaise that we feel in our society where like, oh, all of these things are the worst shock ever because we don't actually then have the reality of, well, yes, the shocks of your boss being a jerk and your friends being mean and society being mean are crummy, but at the same time, you're going to have to go out and do farming or you'll die of starvation. Right. Uh, That was the other part of the rat analogy was sparsely delivered shocks that were preceded by the tone produce this anxiety freezing behavior, but fairly commonly delivered shocks preceded by the tone produced a a rat that worked through the tone yeah, and, and access reinforcers through the tone. But it would explain, I think, why so much of our behavior does result in the freezing up and how, you know, while you kind of like we talked about last week, the idea right. of, you know, nature is coercive. And if you're still living in an area of the world where the worst coercion you face is from Mother Nature herself, you will deal with all the other coercion that your society places upon you. But when you're, you know, fortunate enough to live in a first world country then, oh, aren't these all the worst things that could possibly happen? But it is a reality that it does result in many people in our society not engaging in the behavior that would improve their their life because they spend so much of their time freezing up mm-hmm. because so much of what they're facing is coercion. Even people you you know know and, and see regularly, that might be a lot of how they spend their day. And it's not quite as, as tragic as the 
you know, the senior citizen placed in the home and all their reinforcers are removed. But it's the same idea of it's really easy to remove people's reinforcers and to just leave them in this this state. I think we see that in our, in our schools. I mean, what's what's the biggest problem facing our youth today? Oh, it's anxiety. Everyone's got an anxiety disorder. And it does feel like rather than acknowledging, like, what are behaviors that but exacerbate anxiety or exacerbate the behaviors around anxiety? I think we're looking at what are the internal states of anxiety? Because we need to deal with the anxiety in ourselves. That's how we'll deal with our anxiety. Like, we just get in this circular logic. And there's no great answer. There are great answers. No one's looking at those great answers. They're sort of just mm-hmm. going in the same roundabout verbal behavior about anxiety that I feel like we've seen for the past five, ten years. And it's it's unfortunate. This would be one one effective way to change some of that. Yeah. And, of course, that leads us to the next chapter, which is the, the idea that coercion breeds coercion. The more one engages in coercion, the more you'll see coercion. And, again, we go back to the rats. And this, actually, when I read I read this chapter, and then soon after that was driving somewhere with my mother, who I have not put in a, in a, uh, a retirement home <laughs> yet that she knows of. I uh, know I have not. We're coming for you. And... <laughs> But we were driving and someone honked at her and her immediate reaction was, you know, what my mother does when, when things are upsetting to her is she just starts kind of on a tirade. She, she gets upset and it's sort of this like sad, like, oh, you're not doing anything about this. You're just clearly upset and you're angry and you're not lashing out. Like she wasn't yelling at me, but clearly the only person who was hearing how mad she was, was, was me, you. someone who had done nothing. I was just sitting in the car, unable to control anything. And this takes us back to Jackie, you want to do or who wants to do who wants to be a rat? A rat descriptor for this chapter, too. The punishment-induced aggression of the rat. Well, that actually, I can talk about the original, there was original research by Azrin, uh, where he looked at uh, aggression actually served as a reinforcer. So they had this uh, monkey. He was like a little chimpanzee monkey in a chamber. Right, and he would be delivered a shock on his tail. They don't let you do this anymore. No, they don't. Know. This is <laughs> very reason. old. Yeah, they give a shock on his tail, and when he got a shock at his tail, they showed that attacking a ball, like pulling down the ball and biting it, actually increased. So it was reinforcing following that shock, which would show us in the laboratory that this punishment induced aggression may actually reinforce. Behavior like I don't like getting behavior. a shock on my tail. No, no me mm-hmm. neither. The corollary there being, you know, my mother. Someone honked at her. Yeah. We all know what a honk is. A honk is supposed to be like, "Hey, watch out! You might crash into me." It's a signal. We want it to be a signal of, "Oh, you know, it's an SD for change what you're doing." It should really be more than one honk. Well, th- we I also agree. got in that discussion in the car. But the first response my mother had was to get really angry and to start kind of getting upset. And she got upset at the person who's closest to her, which was me, because I was sitting right next to her. Well, I love this. They always talk about this, too, when you're talking about mainstream psychology, about, like, if you have a bad day at work, then you go home and you may be um, not as nice to your, like, spouse as that's the first person you see, even though your spouse didn't do anything. And then your spouse then may not be as nice to the kids, right? Because they can't be nice to you because of a power struggle, right? Yeah. And then your kids. It's like the fill your bucket book. <laughs> yeah. No, right? But then they're like. I love and then, that book. Yeah. And then the kids may be mean to kids at school or maybe mm-hmm. mean to the dog. They talked about that as an example here, right. too, about, like, the, you can't be mean to the baby. The kids yeah, fill now your bucket. To the it's dog. a fun metaphor for children. It's not actually a description of the behavioral principles I, in play. But I think, you know. Think we could make it work. I think we could make it work because this is punishment-induced aggression in different forms, even if it's verbal aggression. Yeah. Which I, I wouldn't agree because the first time I read that, like, a side effect of punishment is punishment as a reinforcer and i was like what? oh right yeah and then i'm always like what cooper <laughs> look that in the book because you might be like what cooper let's just go past that because it doesn't make sense but mm-hmm. it actually does and these are all the examples mm-hmm. that would work with that yeah and i think that goes into you know last week we talked about the idea of punishment can it change behavior of course yes is it an effective treatment for changing behavior and one of the concerns is well define effective and i think when we look at all of these other side effects of punishment It's really hard to say that it is effective except for certain situations. Knowing that any coercive practice is going to lead to some amount of either counter control or possibly even, you know, (laughs) actual aggression. I mean, think about the last time someone said something to you that made you upset or gave you like bad, like just negative, nasty feedback. Not like supportive feedback, like, you know, behavioral skills training feedback, but like was just obnoxious to you. Depending on your audience, depending on the other reinforcement contingencies, you either chewed out whoever that was 
or you saved it, like you were saying, Jackie, or you, or you sort of you saved that, and then you ran the scenario over and over in your mind until you got to a situation in which you could engage in your own coercion with a different outcome. One thing I love about this article, I mean this book, what in this chapter specifically when he talks about moving forward, he talks about counter control. So if you do see so coercion, there may be some counter control, but it may not be advantageous. And he says on page 217, a spouse counters sexual blackmail with, with infidelity. A teenager's blaring hi-fi. <laughs> and I was like, I circled in, I'm like, what's that? I'm sure it's a stereo. Yeah. But it's yeah. Like, a teenager's High fidelity. Blaring, hi-fi keeps parents from, from kind of confining him or her to the house. They're like, we want to make sure, we want to ground him, but we also don't want to listen to his music. Yeah. And I right. love that. By vomiting at the table, a child avoids being forced to eat non-preferred foods. Like, yeah. Yeah. that issue of counter control is real. I was surprised counter control didn't wasn't a title of its own chapter. I agree. No, chapter. and it, it had come up multiple times as sort of like a end of a paragraph. And this might lead to counter control. Yeah. But this is the first chapter that I think it got real time. And it, and it was really defined. And yeah. I wonder. So he defines it oh, yeah. as behavior that deflects punishment or the threat of punishment. Mm. And I'm wondering if he didn't make his own chapter because I felt, I wonder if he felt unsure because every other chapter had some laboratory evidence that could fit into it but here as he just says like it's really hard to capture counter control within the laboratory because the participants the rats don't have direct access to the experiment right. yeah oh, so he's be. right so i'm wondering if he was like it's not like in gremlins when the gremlin escaped <laughs> right. and like killed the professor right. <laughs> yeah it, that or can't like happen in ratatouille when they run the um health inspector out of the restaurant yep there are plenty of real life scenarios, but let's go to the ones that are fake, you know, in a movie. <laughs> but no, but Mostly like into rats, right? <laughs> but in, in he said that there's very little laboratory ever, evidence because the counter control can't happen. Yeah. But yeah. they have seen a lot of punishment inducing aggression. Yep. In the literature, because you can just put an unsuspecting pigeon in there. You can shock a monkey. Yeah. Uh, and we don't anymore. we don't engage anymore. in that you know yeah. th- i mean as as society because again we're talking about you know multiple sources of control in right. our lives you know if your boss starts yelling at you by the rat experiment you would then punch your boss in the face <laughs> but of course we amazing. don't do that because there are so many other contingencies <laughs> in place you know you know if i punch my boss in the face i'll get fired and, watch out boss you know, i'm coming for you maybe i actually got Take in a fight you know in school and, and i got in trouble it. yeah but again, but again, but I think of like all the music examples, right? Mm-hmm. There's like a, so much counter control, I think, in music, yeah. mm-hmm. right? Or like Welcome to the Jungle or like School's Out for Summer. Like those are great counter control. Yeah, that is the best. Songs. School's Out for Summer. I do. I do love the <laughs> idea that I'm going to write a song about blowing the hell out of my school and how we all kind of laugh about it. Like, oh, that's an amusing song. But like, no, this song was not written as like, won't this be a funny song? It was totally written by Alice Cooper as sort of like, God, I hated school when I was a kid. <laughs> and I wanted so much to blow up the school. And it was the best thought ever because my teachers were super mean. But I'll write a song and it'll be kind of funny. You know, and, and I think simply even still brings up it. the idea of the artist as a lot of, you know, behavior that we would consider to be you know psychotic or <laughs> completely unhelpful in society. So many artists have taken that counter control and they've turned it into something that Music society is counter control yeah and what right fight the man yeah and then when you're talking to non-behavior analysts about control and counter control i think people get a little bit uh nervous mm-hmm. i think when behavior analysts will talk about oh yeah i can demonstrate functional control i can turn behavior on and off you know based on the environment that makes people a little bit uncomfortable, mm-hmm. right? And so they're like, "Who? Like, how can you just talk about that?" With us, it's like, "Oh yeah, of course, we can demonstrate functional control. We can manipulate the environment." But then I feel like outside people are like, "What gives? Who gives you the right?" Yeah, to, to yeah. Do is that, that where they right? talk about this? Like, yep. who's doing the yeah, controlling? Well, and, yeah, I, I mean that's throughout the book. But I think that also comes to the idea that even counter control. Sidman doesn't use that term as counter control. It's a bad thing. No. Counter control a is thing. a principle. And then he even brings up the idea of, you know, think about the American system of government where we have our executive and our judicial and our legislative branches and they have checks and balances as that being how counter control can actually be a benefit right. to society. The idea that we all should be able to exert some amount of counter control over the people around us. Mm-hmm. However, for the most part, when you see counter control, it is in response to the coercive practices that our society right. provides us or engages right. us yeah. with. And the general society probably, what he thinks, may ask, 
Like, why should behavior be controlled? Like, why are you even talking about that? But we know that behavior is controlled by contingencies, right? So I love that he says uh, on page 218, he says, experimental behavior analysis do not advocate behavioral control. They study it. it like, literally, I these, loved this chapter too. or this paragraph. And then they study it. Applied behavior analysis do not make conduct controllable. Given the existing control, they try to modify it in directions that individuals and communities consider desirable. And then he's like, mic drop! Yeah. It's like if a physicist isn't considered to be a proponent of the laws of physics. (laughs) Yes. It's like a behaviorist isn't a proponent of the principles of behavior. You study them. They exist on their own. Yeah. I love that. I love that too. And I do like that he, he, you know, brings to light that our behavior, usually we give control away to like large entities, right? Like the government, law enforcement, right? We all engage in these Mm -hmm. things and that we want to make sure that they're acting in our best interest as a group. Sometimes they're not. Yeah, right. And then he gets into coercive groups do not hold power usually for that long, right? There right. is counter control that is either a built-in mechanism to very strong government or occurs organically through the people in some form of uprising or coup to balance out an overly co- coercive government. Mm. So before we get to the big ending chapters discussing why we as a society engage in coercive practices and how we might do a better job, let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. be a bcba sure we all do now you can come to regis college in weston mass to get your graduate degree choose from any one of these courses masters of science in applied behavior analysis masters of science in special education dual degree in special ed and aba or be eligible for your post master certificate you can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years And our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support, ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. Learn more at regiscollege.edu. Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu. Regiscollege.edu. One more time www.regiscollege.edu. See you there! And we are back discussing the second half of Murray Sidman's Coercion and its fallout. So we've been talking about all the coercive practices our society engages in, but before... We start talking about some of the light at the end of the coercion tunnel. I want to make sure that our listeners know that, hey, you know what? Here at this podcast, we're not all about coercion. We like to reinforce our listeners. And one of the ways we like to do that is by being ace approved. Yes, by listening to this podcast, you can earn continuing education credits. All you need to do is listen to the episode and then go to our website, abainsidetrack.com slash get hyphen CEUs, and you can order CEs for listening to the show. The first code word, because you're going to need to know two code words as part of your application, is parsnip. P-A-R-S-N-I-P. Parsnip. It's a root vegetable. Some people who listen to this might not eat too many parsnips. I think we live in New England, so we got a lot of root vegetables in the winter time. It's kind of part of the heritage turnips parsnips are kind of the same thing but they're slightly different no one likes either um do you remember that awesome story stone soup of course i know the story stone stone soup rob uh in which there was a some Two sort adorable of adorable pigs well it could also have been a hobo i had a version where there was a hobo but in any case there's like a magic rock which gets everyone to give the hobo or the two pigs all these great things including things like parsnips to make a delicious soup that everyone can enjoy Soup from a stone. Soup from a stone. But the code word's not stone or soup. It's parsnip. An ingredient in soup. Parsnip. From a stone. 
from <laughs> So when we left off, we sort of rounded the bend on all of the ways that Murray Sidman describes our society as being awful, awful, coercive monsters. But let's talk about why. Just like, you know, the organism is always... Point. No, I know that's not his <laughs> point. I know. But again, the organism is always right. Why do we, the royal we, engage in coercive practices so readily when we know, well, some of us know, that there are better ways to change behavior? Because the Punisher sees immediate reinforcing effects and the side effects that almost always do occur are delayed. Thereby, we don't always see them being tied to the reinforcer of the punishment because they are so delayed for the reinforcer. Mm -hmm. Jackie, counterpoint. (laughs) Counterpoint. We also need to think about side effects. Not really a counterpoint. It's actually just a... Co point. <laughs> Co point. <laughs> Contra point. Contra point. No, that would be against. No, it's it's a it's a I don't know. But what I can say is that side effects Co point. Co point. Co point. Side effects also may be delayed mm-hmm. as well. So they may not be immediate, so you may not tie those side effects to the actual punisher. Mm-hmm. I think she said the same point better. Oh. Yes. We only have the one point. It's only the one point. Yeah. One point just saying over and over again. Yep. I you want th- me to say it again? No, no I'm just kidding. It's, it's two times is enough. I did like, and it's in my notes, and I can't remember if it was explicitly in the book or if I sort of had extrapolated from it, but the idea of our society as being fluent in the delivery of punishment. Mm. And I think we do have to address the idea that even those of us who understand how reinforcement is a much more effective treatment for changing behavior than any sort of a coercive practice, so negative reinforcement, certainly, certainly more than punishment, we are all so much better at delivering punishment that I think there is a huge amount of response effort that would need to be engaged with to use reinforcement practices. And that seems very sad, but I think it is a truth that changing society, and I think these last chapters really point out, if we wanted to change everything to be more of a reinforcement-based economy, it would take an extraordinary amount of work. And what do individuals not love to engage in? Why? New behavior that requires a high amount of response effort and results in delayed reinforcement. <laughs> Slow change. <laughs> so that is going to be a real problem that we face in changing all of society. I also like the point that he he says that it's easy. That's one of his points. Uh, and then he's also said that... What, we, that punishment's easy? Yeah, coercion oh, sure. is easy, yeah, right? it's easy. Just, yeah. We don't need a lot of training, right? It's short, it's quick. And then I also like that he says that it's inevitable, right? So because there's... Things are going to happen. Tornadoes. I know, but we were going to have this part be positive. It is positive. Well, I, I think that idea that, that <laughs> there is an inevitability to coercion. Right. Nature will always exist. Nature engages in, in, in coercion. It always will. We can't change right. nature. There's also social competition. They talk about that. Yep. Right, so that's mm-hmm. always going to exist, but it's how we manipulate the contingencies of reinforcement that counteract that. Mm. Well, however, I did think about the idea of competition Ooh. as, and I did think about a recent development. Now, it is with a very narrow understanding of business and technology. Okay, so this may be totally wrong, and please write in if I'm way off base. And we you need know more some errata for for our next. Our August preview, so do it. When I heard competition, the idea of we only have so many resources, therefore, there's always going to be some amount of coercive behavior because we all want to gain access to as much of that pie as we can. I think about Microsoft, the company. Now, if you grew up in the 90s, (laughs) you might remember the antitrust lawsuit filed against Microsoft. When Microsoft had an operating system, in that operating system, they had an internet browser, they had... The, the, they'd cornered the market on sort of computers and computing and is this using. When they had the toasters as the screensaver. Yeah, around that time. It was later. That's later. That's Windows 3.1, I think. No, Windows 95. Had oh, that Windows 95. Okay, so yes, it was around that time, and it was determined that Microsoft was a monopoly. They were trying to control all the business. Therefore, that's that's un-American. That's that's illegal, and so they were they had to break off certain components of their business. And there was that concern of, oh, this huge business is going to fail now because they can't be overly competitive. But now much of what Microsoft's platform is on is the idea that, well, we own these clouds and we can do all this cloud computing and we have all these services and we can put our services everywhere. 
And if we put our service on your device, your device benefits, so you make more money, but we also make more money because our services are on your device. So a lot of their business model really is, I don't want to say antithetical to the idea of competition because I don't know enough about it, but it is the idea of we're providing a service and we want everyone to have that service and your using our service allows you to benefit from the fact that you're using our service, your company, your, your pipelines for content whatever operating system you're using and how that really does show that there are ways that we can all win. You know, there are business models that do allow for everyone to gain. You know, what's, what's the old saying that the rising tide all win a little. raises all ships. So the Microsoft can win a lot. I not exactly. The That's point. what they say. And again, I'm oversimplifying it, but there are ways I think as a society, we can get around the idea of competition and still be successful. You know, you think about, well, if every society were making money, then every society would be doing better. But that would allow for everyone to have more money, which would allow for everyone to buy more goods and services, which would allow for every business to do better. There are ways for us to grow as sort of a worldwide society that don't involve around coercive practices. That's we don't, true. We don't think about them too often, right. but they exist. They do exist. And I think it also, tying into that point, you also think have to think about how you can bridge that gap between the behavior and the consequence when the behavior won't immediately be reinforced, right? So in this sense, they're thinking more long term, right? They're not thinking in the in the in the moment, right? In the moment, right now, we're not going to charge you a million dollars so that we can have a million dollars. They're thinking down the line. If you're benefiting, you're going to stay with the company, which is going to produce the company yep. more money, right? But that, I think that is a really crucial point that we often lose because it's not immediate, right? And I always think about this when we're thinking about the environment, right? Well, right? I want to say too, uh, right? Yeah. You can say it because you love the environment. When we talk about money exchanging hands, I get really confused because yeah. Rob already knows. Yes. I can't follow any movie but you, there's like a mob plot. If there's a mob or a heist but or, now, or someone buys something at a store, it's just forget it. Yeah, I'm completely out. lost, but I'm – okay, I'm on board. Okay, good. Go ahead. Tell me what you were thinking. No, you t- tell me. I'll <laughs> tell you. So I was thinking like think about a change that you need to make, right, to be more environmentally friendly. So I was thinking about how I could reduce my plastic consumption. Mm-hmm. Short term – that's actually kind of annoying, uh-huh. right? Short term, yes. that's going to be super annoying because I'm going to have to like, and probably more expensive, right? Because I'm going to have to buy more things that are glass-based. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have to go to the grocery store and think about other products that I might buy that mm-hmm. are not made in, like, in plastic. Yeah. Like I can't do frozen foods anymore because they all have the plastic lining in the inside, mm. right? So if you think about that, the short-term consequence is pretty aversive, right? Because it's more yeah. work for me. Yeah. But – it's bridging that gap between the short-term consequence and the long-term benefit. And so then, like, maybe I tell someone I'm doing it, and then I show them, right? So then maybe those actions will reinforce the actions of, like, removing the plastic. Mm-hmm. And then knowing, right, that I'm not going to, like, be killing myself and other people in the long-distant future. Yeah. But when I read when I read that part, when he's talking about how you can – counteract those immediate benefits for a long-term consequence as would be beneficial for all i thought about the environment because i think there's a lot of work we have to do but it'll yeah. be better well, i was thinking about this in terms of what rob was saying that nature itself is coercive and mm-hmm. that's really like the ultimate example that we're facing right now is climate change and what are we going to do as the humans who have created this problem to fix it when there's clearly no short-term reinforcers available that are going to help start and sustain this behavior that ultimately is going to be a huge punisher for if all I'm of lucky, us. I will just be dead and my children can deal with the problem. Well, then you're part of the problem. Yeah. Right? <laughs> uh, another little, like, dated portion of this is they're like, don't teach kids, like, overarching consequences. Like, if you murder someone, you'll go to jail, right? Or if you murder someone, you'll die because those don't have immediate effects, right? Because you don't think of yourself as being dead. Or mm-hmm. dying when you're young, right? You're like, I can jump off this bridge and only go through this tiny hole and not hit that rock and die because I'm invincible. Mm-hmm. But I love, he was like, but if you take away their portable tape player, that might be a more immediate consequence. Nice. I love a nice. portable tape player. <laughs> and he updated this in 2008. And your child will right? say, what the hell did you just take away? I don't know what that piece of technology right? like, is. I don't even know what that does. What are those buttons? But I laughed about that and I highlighted it and put it in a little square so that i would tell you guys about it (laughs) nice now we're getting into the last couple chapters which do start to talk about the different ways ideas 
And Simon is very honest about, these are ideas I have that may or may not work, but let's start somewhere. And chapter 16 is the first of those chapters called, Is There Any Other Way? Which I wish he'd called, There's, There's got, got to, to be, be a, a better, better way. way. <laughs> and this is going to represent our dissemination station, right? Because yes. the whole book has been about, this is what's happening now, and now our dissemination is what can we do about it? Yep. Yeah. When we look at the idea of any other way, of course there is another way. And certainly Sidman will tell us, well, it's positive reinforcement. And there's a quote on page 240. Positive reinforcement works and coercion is dangerous. I <laughs> so highlighted you, that too. Yeah. It's our guiding principle, right? right? This is what we should always remember. Yeah. So there you go. So if you take one thing out of this book, I'll be really sad if that's the only thing because that is part of everything you learned as a behavior analyst. It's in the ethical code. Right. You should know way more than that. But if you learn two things, make sure that's one of them. <laughs> Sidman is very open about how positive reinforcement, while it is that guiding principle, he's not so naive as to think, and positive reinforcement will solve all the problems. But he does understand how there'll be a component of positive reinforcement in all of these solutions that somebody, hopefully all of us, and not just us here, you there, come up with to make society a better place to live. I think one of the first things the first things he brings up as what we need to get out to society at large is the idea that control exists. And once we get people to examine the belief that control means bad rather than control is always there no matter what you do there'll always be a level of control we can start getting individuals to engage in control that is more appropriate mm -hmm. so by using positive reinforcement as their control of choice rather than refusing to accept that control exists therefore continuing to engage in coercive practices that makes it sound so easy right but like this boils down to like the fundamental difference between radical behaviorism and generally our entire culture's way of thinking right which is the difference between free will and behavior that is a product of its history so it's not as easy as, as perhaps that makes it seem. Dinah, it's going to be as easy as getting people to accept climate change. I will yell at them and I will show them science and facts and make them feel stupid and they will change their behavior, right? Science. I will get Bill Nye to scream it from the rooftops. He's already done that. And it worked great, right? <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> Bill yeah, Nye is secretly like when kids are watching their TV shows, he's secretly giving them subliminal messages like tell your parents. Climate change is real. <laughs> no, yeah, and, and it, it is sad that it is not that simple. That step one, convincing people that control exists, is probably <laughs> the hardest of these steps. Because honestly, once everyone accepts, yes, control exists, I think it would be a lot. Of, I, I, I think the sort of end, let's engage in these types of control. It's scary. Than these it's a really scary hard. idea to most people. Right. I love that he, he ties this in when he talks about like saying no. Mm -hmm. And how no shouldn't be viewed as a punisher mm -hmm. for any type of behavior. But he says no should now come to serve as, but rather do this. <laughs> I like that. But rather. So no signals that other alternative behavior will be reinforced mm -hmm. in the absence of doing that behavior. And that's the idea of discipline. Right. And when we think of discipline, take a second. Think about the word discipline. What do you think of? Just think, you. Karate. You at home. You probably thought of some, what? Jackie said me. karate. Jackie said karate. Because people need to have discipline. Did you at oh, home say karate? I thought of the nuns wrapping you on the knuckles. Oh, the we ruler. thought of, yep. And I'm thinking most people thought of discipline as some sort of like a negative thing. Some so sort not of like karate? Punishment. Probably <laughs> not karate. Unless they thought of like coercive karate. I thought we were doing an association right there and it worked. <laughs> no. Nope. Discipline. Karate. karate. Ralph Macchio. <laughs> karate kid. <laughs> no. Discipline. And Sidman defines discipline as training by instruction and practice. So that goes into what you're saying, Jackie, the idea of karate. We need to change no to be a statement of discipline in terms of training. It's a training statement. When we say no, wouldn't it be great if we all heard the word no and said, oh, 
that's not the right way to do it, but there's another way to do it. And I know you, caregiver or person in charge or boss, will show me the right way to do it so that I can be successful. As opposed to no now, which is no, which is go to hell, jerk. Don't tell me how to do my job. You're probably wrong and I hate you because I'm having some sort of ag- aggression related to your coercion right now. I don't want to live in that side anymore. I'm tired of it, folks. So what about the change? What about talking about how we can use positive reinforcement at home and in school? You know what? That's a good idea, Jackie. Let's get into those last chapters. We actually talk about real. Right. Well, I don't want to say real solutions, but let's talk about possible solutions that are worth trying. And Sidman is very honest. It's not like, and if everyone just followed my 10-point plan, (laughs) society would not use coercion. He is very honest about like, I have no clue if these things will work. I don't want to oversimplify the problems however i know some version of positive reinforcement will do a better job than any of the coercive practices that have been used since time immemorial right so all right let's talk about positive reinforcement at home and school which sounds like his own great book it does it (laughs) does well a lot of the things that he says uh, about the home really resonated with me and how we talked about positive parenting uh in that book that we talked about last year in our book club because they were like, yeah, contingencies are important, right? You need to set limits. You need to follow through. But you also need to make sure that you're delivering a lot of positive reinforcers mm-hmm. for appropriate behavior and making sure that kids don't feel like if they make a mistake that they're going to lose that, right? So I like that that feeling. Uh, I do also love these notes that we should bring up that – with special, the notes I wrote? Yeah, the special demands of children. They apparently don't know how annoying they are. <laughs> I love that. But right. it's and true. And by that he meant that small children, they're, they are the center of their own world. Right. So mm-hmm. they're always asking for something and presenting pretty much constant demands. They haven't, they haven't learned that there not, are other people right. that have different needs and wants right. than, than them. Right. And it, it takes sort of transcending the environment in which you're in to not allow your children to become conditioned punishers to you yeah. right right like and if to they're respond singing. to them in ways that are are then relieving to you but punishing to them well right. it's like that it's it's like in positive parenting most of the behavior our children engage in is that weed behavior it's mm-hmm. really annoying and it seems to grow really fast and if we don't pay attention to it and focus on the things that they're doing right, our children will grow up nicely. Right. Whereas if we spend all our efforts on trying to punish the behavior that we hate, we'll just teach a bunch of children either what they should do to piss us off the most as a form of counter control, right. or mm-hmm. we'll just have children that hate us and try to escape from us as fast as, as, soon possible. as possible. Right. I, I was actually glad that I read this over the weekend because I just did an eight over an eight hour car trip today and in the car my young two-year-old sang a song about Michael Finnegan. I don't know if this song, if you guys there know this song. There was a man named Michael Finnegan. He had whiskers on his chin again. They he grew out and then grew in again. again. Poor old Michael Finnegan. Finnegan. Begin again. Begin again. So she sang that for about an hour and a half. <laughs> and You're literally- so close to have a personal device. <laughs> Let me let me positively reinforce your being quiet by continual access to electronic media. But literally, I was like, I want to yell at her so bad. I want to scream like, shut up. <laughs> because I just couldn't. I like, she was like, begin again. And I they could be quiet for like two seconds. And I'm like, yes. And then it would come back hmm. literally for an hour and a half. But I chose to be like, nice job singing. You're really using your words. <laughs> but I didn't mean it. Yeah. And I wonder if she didn't know that. But she picked right? up on the sarcasm in your yeah. voice. And oh, body my language. God. But yeah, so I think that's it's sometimes really hard, right? Because it's the same principle as you would have in in school and that Simon brings up in school. It's really the same whether you're at home or at school. So whether you're a parent or you're a teacher, what we should be focusing on is what behaviors do we want them to engage in? If we show them how to engage in those behaviors and then go out of our way to positively reinforce through praise, through access to tangibles, the stuff that we want to see more of, we'll see more of that behavior. If we ignore the behavior that we don't like and we reinforce the behavior that we like, we don't need to punish anything, but we'll see the good stuff happen more and the bad stuff happen less. The issue that runs that we run into is that it is so easy to engage in punishment. It is something that we've learned ourselves. So we engage in the punishment procedures. 
we are reinforced for engaging in punishment procedure. We therefore engage in more punishment procedures. But we don't necessarily ever teach anything. It's the same as school. Why do kids not want to go to school? Because more often than not, they encounter punishment contingencies. Right. And this is even, and I think our, our, our modern schools are much kinder, and much more aware of the challenges our, our students face than ever before. Mm-hmm. And it's still very hard to get everyone to get on board with this idea of, no, 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 it's a lot of work to teach the new behavior. Sidman even goes as far as to discuss, wouldn't it be great if we all paid more attention to Fred Keller's work of our personalized systems of instruction? Because, hey, isn't that almost an automatic way to just focus on positive reinforcement for new behaviors rather than all the crap that kids really hate dealing with in school, which is the no, you're wrong, no, you're wrong, I hate school, I'm going to engage in counter control, now my teachers even matter at me. I loved his ideas about teach something and then tie the reinforcer into what was just taught, right? So, like, teach a math skill and then use it to go shopping and purchase a new item. I oh, love that, that was great. Yeah. Or learn to write a paragraph and then get to write a paragraph on something you like or, de- or write a paragraph about debate about mm-hmm. something that you like. Right? I thought that those were really nice and it made me, like, fantasize about making my own school yeah. in which you, you know, use PSI to, like, drill the things you need to learn and learn them as quickly and efficiently as possible and then sp- spend the rest of the time doing enriching reinforcing activities on what you just learned. Wouldn't well, that be great? Well, that goes into into the next chapter, the positive reinforcement in institutions, the idea of our prison systems. You know, and I loved how he described the prison systems almost as an idealized school. The idea of we have individuals, you know, who gets incarcerated? We all know who gets incarcerated. It's not the rich white people who run Those businesses. People, except for Martha Stewart. Well, she got out too. She got incarcerated uh, though. She did. But, but, but I think about her a lot, actually. But again, I, I I feel like that was the case of like, I guess eventually we have to put one of these white people in jail. <laughs> we'll put her in jail. And then she baked for everyone. And then uh, she's nice. She'll probably deal with it okay. And then we'll move on. And then we don't have to do it anymore. Who goes to jail? People from low socioeconomic classes, people who didn't finish school, people who don't have a lot of skills. They are the individuals who don't have a lot of access to reinforcement. They mostly meet coercive contingencies. When people are put into our prison systems, I think we all, similar to how Sidman talked about the idea of we need to accept that control exists, we all need to accept, why do we put people in prisons? Because we want to hurt them. We want them to feel bad for the things they did. We want it to be punitive. If we all accepted that we put people in prison because we wanted bad things to happen to them, because we're mad at them for committing crimes, we'd be a lot closer to reforming our prison systems than we are now which is this fake idea of oh they're gonna learn from their mistakes oh they'll be better people when they come no, out it, it's clear that that's not how yeah. our so step one except that you system works. only ever supported the prison system because you want to see people punished that's not good but i feel like murray sidman would say you know what the person who says i want someone to go to prison because i want them to feel awful is probably closer to changing our society than the person who's deluding themselves into thinking, I want them to go to prison because they need to be rehabilitated and we'll give them a second chance. That person's much farther. They sound nicer, but they are much farther from any sense of how can we reestablish our society to be non-coercive because they're deluded. They don't understand what prison is like. We're not funding our prison systems in any way that would allow them to be rehabilitated. We don't set up, even if we were funding them, we'd give them more money. We don't actually set up the systems to allow for any amount of education. But going back to your point, I've gone off on an a angry tirade for a minute there. Just like in school, I loved how Sidman discussed the idea of what if we set up contingencies of, hey, you are not forced to go to school or learn a trade or learn new skills in prison. But if you do, you will get access to privileges. What are those privileges to start Token economy stuff, oh, you get cigarettes, or you get access to the exercise yard more often, or, oh, you get access to more uh, TV time. But over time, you will have learned to engage in learning behavior. What will you find more reinforcing then? Now you get access to books. What do you find reinforcing when you have more access to books? The idea you're going to get a job. Now clothes suddenly become reinforcing because you want to apply for a job when you get out of prison. So if we just spent the time of teaching a couple small behaviors using basic behavioral principles, we would allow for the development of new reinforcers. Like like you said way earlier in the show, Diana, those cusps. Once you find new skills, you will find new reinforcers. Well, I think there's a lot of reason why people go to prison, right? Mm-hmm. So their environment may not be set up for success, right? So prison may actually be a better environment than mm-hmm. what they were going that what they were leaving, right? So those people 
may actually want jobs and that's the only way they're going to get a job is to go to prison right so that could be mm-hmm. that could be a way to think about it because we i don't well they, they think we're talking about what are the jobs what are the jobs the you know many of the individuals who are going to prison would be able to get when they leave prison they're going to be jobs that do not provide probably as much potential for reinforcement as continuing to engage in criminal behavior that's one of the reasons we see high recidivism rates with prisons that's a big word. And thank you. Well, Use... there are ways to change this. Of course, there are ways so. to change this. But and and Sidney describes a few. But it's not set up right now. And then another no, problem not. that that is continuing is that individuals who have served their time and are out of prison are still met with a lot of punishers within our society mm-hmm. regarding past, regarding going to jail. So if you've been in jail, yep, that's also a punisher. Right. So it can be very difficult to get. A upstanding job you can no longer vote in our society and you're just viewed as sort of a less than citizen in many different ways so there are things that can be changed outside of the prison system as well as inside the prison system to provide these individuals with more opportunity and when, access when they leave to mm-hmm. to reinforcers mm-hmm. and, and again i'm only going from the citizen's book i am not an expert in our uh, the, you know the american penal system but at least going through the book the average prisoner who goes to prison, if you don't go to school, you're going to get punished or you're going to be put in solitary confinement. So we're not necessarily teaching individuals to value education the way that I think reinforcement would allow for more value for education. We're sort of setting up the same coercive systems that many of these individuals saw when they were not in prison, which means they're not necessarily learning new behavior so much as engaging in whatever behavior they have to because they're in the closed system that a prison is. And once they leave prison, they may have learned a few new skills. However, they haven't necessarily learned about new reinforcers. Many of the reinforcers are the same. They don't necessarily have enough of the skills uh, to in, to access some of those reinforcers, even if they wanted those reinforcers. And like you said, Diana, they're still going back to the exact same course of society they left. Yeah, and, and that can be a big problem. And, you know, what one views as a valuable education may be different than what someone else views as a valuable education. And I think we want to be careful there as well with putting a judgment on what's a more valuable education. I think the programs that have been most successful in providing job opportunities and educational opportunities to individuals in the prison system have looked at what are your just like we just like we do as behavior analysts, right? Like what are your individual interests? What are your individual strengths and how can we combine those into something that when when you leave are going to provide you an opportunity to access reinforcers readily and provide for you and your family in a meaningful way Mm -hmm. yes and i i honestly do not know whether that is something that has been a part of prison reform in the past number of years since this book was written i have no idea I, i i again only can speak for the the book itself all right. So I'm sorry if this this next section might sound weird or like we cut off a bit. And I'll be honest, it's because we did. Uh, the last chapter of the book, Law Enforcement and Diplomacy, was when we really did. We, we actually had a nice like 10, 15 minute conversation about what that entails, what the ideas were. And it was really one that was, I don't want to, it, it was not heated or angry, but it certainly was fight. one Nobody left. that given how long our episode is already gone, given how low kind of wrap, we want to wrap up the book club for the year was one that we felt we weren't going to be able to do enough justice to. Ah, law enforcement justice. We weren't going to be able to give the time it needed, I think, to put together the coherent arguments, even if all we talked about was what Sidman put forth. So just very briefly, the chapter really talks about the idea of law enforcement and diplomacy as, wouldn't it be nice if we looked at some of those systems and how many of these systems that we think of as there to support us really do still engage in some amount of coercive practice? And wouldn't it be good if we could think of ways to flip that around and use positive reinforcement? Uh, you know, one of the ideas I, I think he has is, what if you got pulled over and the police officer gave you a ticket for great driving and it was worth 10% off at your next trip to McDonald's or something? I actually you would know? love that. That would be, But again, we'd have to change a lot of how society sees yeah. it. Because even if I knew there was a good chance I got pulled over to get a ticket for how great I was driving, my first thought would probably be, oh, God, I got pulled over by the police. It's going to be bad. But again, I think that goes to the point that Simmons making of so many of our supports in society, we think of with kind of that negative 
connotation to it or, or we might think of with that negative connotation to it and there might be better ways to handle things but again that's a chapter i think you should read think about discuss with your friends your own we had a very fun discussion but again i don't think we were able to give it enough time for the show given how long we're going so we decided we would uh keep that to ourselves uh if you're interested in talking with us about it send write us, us on email. facebook or send us an email with your thoughts and we'll be happy to share it on the on the preview episode for the month and that brings us to the end of Coercion and its fallout. So with the book club, it's really hard to sum up every single thing that we might have learned from a book or we might have learned from our discussion. But why don't we go around the table and just really quickly, since we don't have a dissemination station, talk about something that we took from this book that we found interesting, either that we thought was positive about this book, that we were concerned about with this book, but our overall thoughts on, on the work itself. I think this book just provides a really nice opportunity for us to reflect on our own behavior as well as how our society functions as a whole and attempting to recognize where coercion is occurring in our own life, how we're responding to that, how we may be creating coercive practices within our own relationships with one another, and then also thinking about how our society is currently operating and where coercion might lie in that and overall giving us a better understanding of how the world works. Yeah, I like that. And I like, I thought there was a lot of examples where we could think about society as a whole and how we might be able to change those practices, albeit probably tiny and small, right? Because we can't go and like overtake government, but how we can change society as a whole and how we think about things such as the nursing home example. I think those are really helpful and, and eye-opening because they I didn't think about that before. Yeah. And this is, I'm going to lie, I'm not going to lie, the second time I read this book, way better the second time than when I read the first time. I don't think I got anything of substance out of the first time. Oh, yeah. So I think I was just like reading and I was like, oh yeah, this is great, this is great, this is great. But then I put it down and I was like, oh, I did it. Right? I read the book. So I think if you've read it before, it might be beneficial to read it again because you right. might be in a different p- f- place. Yeah. yeah, and even though it was written a while back, and then even the updates that they did were a while back, there are many timely examples and points that Sidman makes that I think are uh, of the moment that definitely deserve a reread. And the other thing I want to mention is whenever we read anything, all these all these things that are written by sort of the first generation behavior analysts, you just love the perspective that they come in with, right? And they're always tying things back to the experimental literature. And there's both a grounding in the principles and then a lofty reach towards optimism and the overall breadth that behavior analysis can and really should have. And to me, that's always so refreshing and valuable that I encourage everyone to go back and read The Old Dudes. (laughs) <laughs> there's some ladies and ladies mm-hmm. there's a few ladies not many but there's a few for my kind of final thoughts for this being my second read of the book that i noticed a lot more of the flaws in terms of it as a work and i certainly feel bad bringing that up because murray sidman <laughs> just, a man while he's down <laughs> just passed away so he can't write in and tell me what a jerk i am and how wrong i am in my understanding however i do think the core components of the book still rang true And I know when I first read this, it really did change my thinking on how I did everything, how so much of my being was one of coercion in my interactions at work, in my interactions at home, in my interactions with friends. So much of what I have learned to do is coercive. I'm I'm part of that plan. Yeah. (laughs) And similarly, I think when we talk about cultural competence, the idea that we all have to acknowledge that we are from specific backgrounds Mm -hmm. based on who we are. And while there's nothing wrong with being who you are, you have to acknowledge that your development came from a place of different reinforcers, different punishers than somebody with you. I think this book does something very similar in terms of as a society, we engage in lots of different behavior, much of it coercive, not all of it. And all of us to different extents, but we are all engaging in some amount of coercion in our practice. And whether you do as many of the terrible things as Maria Sidman describes in the book, 
It's a lot of terrible things. Whether you book. felt like you read this whole book and you're like, I don't do any of that. I know there was at least a moment where you thought, well, oh, yeah. in that area, I used to do that and I don't anymore. Or, well, I still do that a little bit and I'm going to change. I don't think there's going to be a moment that any of us listening to this podcast are going to hear and feel like, nope, there's no coercion in my practice in any component of my life. I'm sure there's some. And you know what? Maybe in another generation or two, people could read this book and be like, wow, I can't believe people ever behaved this way. I hope so. And that would be great. That would be really great. I think number one is going to be convincing individuals that control exists. Similar to how I think uh, behavioral economics convince people that nudging and changing behavior exists. We have to convince people that control always exists. Right. We then get to choose. The positive is we get to choose what that control is going to be. And we can make it better control than it was before. Love it. And that brings us Ooh. to the end of the show. We did it. Ooh, another book club. What did you say, Diana, in terms of talking about coercion and its fallout? Uh, I find book club to be slightly coercive. <laughs> 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 and that we are taking, you know, multiple hundreds of pages and trying to cram it into a short amount of time. I hear you. It can be tough. I want to make sure everyone gets that second secret code word. And it is portrait. P-O-R-T. R-A-I-T, portrait, like a portrait of an artist as a young man or a portrait of Van Gogh as or other man. artists as a young man. <laughs> Talk about course. It took me three tries to get through portrait of an artist as a young man. I never even as tried. As a young woman. <laughs> portrait. It's good, I think. Well, that brings us to the end of another book club. We're going to close the book on this episode, right? Ha, 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 ha. Uh-huh. I want to thank Jackie and Diana for being here and doing uh, the book club. Again, these get very different than our normal episodes in which we're talking about very, very specific research. So, wait, before you say that, when you say very different, one time when I was in high school, there was on my friend's fridge, there was a magnet and it said, first it gets real, then it gets different, then it gets real different. (laughs) Nice. And so that's what book club is to me. Real different. And also it's pull... been real and it's been fun. And but it wasn't yeah. all real fun. And then also a pull behind the curtain. It's been a couple of weeks uh, due to vacations. <laughs> We've recorded an episode. So we all kind of had to get back into the podcasting mindset, which is not always easy to do. So I hope you all, I'm going to thank you all the listeners. I hope you all enjoyed our discussion of coercion and fallout. And I want to say again, I think we all want to say a big thanks to Murray Sidman and his contributions to the thank field. Thank you, Murray Sidman. Thanks, Murray. You're amazing. If you enjoyed the show, or if you're interested in hearing about our topics when we talk about specific research articles, why not subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the show, or if you don't like the show, hey, leave us a review on any of those places. You can also find us online. We're on social media everywhere as ABA Inside Track. Our website is abainsidetrack.com. And you can always email us with thoughts, with ideas for future topics, and for any comments at abainsidetrack at gmail.com. We'll be back next week with another full-length episode. But until then, keep responding. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.